personal preparedness by their personal preparedness afterward. At De Pere Native, Karen Vincent Humiston has had a lifelong fascination with family history and the pressure to fire. With more than 40 years of experience as a genealogy researcher, Karen has spent the past few years intensively researching the fire and the many and the many families and individuals caught up in it. Her book, The Sky Was Brass, The Earth Was Ashes. The story of the Great Festival of Fire will be released in 2022. Please help me welcome Karen. As we all know, 150 years ago, this area was completely devastated by what came to be called the Great Peshtigo Fire. It's one of the most compelling and fascinating stories in Wisconsin history, and in U.S. history for that matter. It's not just a story of extreme fire behavior, although it certainly is that. It's also a story of families and individuals and the terrible trauma that they endured. I'm going to be focusing on several of these families today and telling the story through their eyes. But first, we need some background. Should we turn the lights down a little more? Yes. 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 Thanks. Okay. Yes. Yes. How to describe the Peshtigo fire? One survivor, Mary Crawford Lady, in her lady years, summed up the experience in these three eloquent words. It, it was hell. Obviously, it happened on the same night as the Great Chicago Fire. That seems like an incredible coincidence until you realize that both conflagrations were caused by similar conditions and fanned by the same weather system. There were also terrible fires that night in Michigan and, and in Minnesota. It was the deadliest fire in U.S. history. Other fires may have been as large, but no other hit a populated area with so much ferocity and so few means of escape. I think the best estimate is that 1,200 to 1,500 people died in the Peshtigo fire. That would be on both sides of the bay. It's very difficult to pin down an exact number of dead. Records were burned. There was a large transient workforce, and many bodies were burned beyond recognition, even to ashes. As one official described it, whole neighborhoods have been swept away without warning or leaving any trace or record to tell the tale. The Peshtigo fire was not a typical fire, the forest fire. It was a fire storm, or as Stephen Pine would call it, a mass fire. It was a conflagration so intense that it created its own weather with violent cyclonic winds. Almost everyone who lived through the Peshtigo fire talked about a tornado, a fire bearing down on Peshtigo. This firestorm created some of the most extreme fire behavior on record. It was actually two fires on either side of the bay, and they were created at close to the same time by the same fuel and weather conditions, and the drought that had been plaguing them all summer. On the east side of the bay, the fire swept up the peninsula from south of New Franklin, almost to Sturgeon Bay, killing many people and leaving many, many more homeless. And the fire was even more ferocious on the west side of the bay, with the fiercest conditions in around Peshtigo. For this reason, the two fires are grouped together under the name Peshtigo Fire. Incidentally, I still hear sometimes that the fire jumped the bay. It did not, and I'm going to show you why I know for sure, aside from the fact that the distance is way too far, 
Uh, the fire started down here in the New Franken area um, earlier, around 7.30. And so the fire started up here around between 8 and 9, depending where you were. So for the Peshtigo fire to have started the fire down here, it would have had to go against the prevailing winds and backwards in time. So it really, truly was two fires. In this presentation, we're going to focus on the Peshtigo. <coughs> This bird's eye map was published in September of 1871, a month before the town was destroyed. The population was approximately 2,000 if you include the farm area. The, the new people were coming in regularly for the many jobs in town. In fact, a large group had arrived to work on the railroad the very day of the fire. There was a large sawmill and woodenware factory, sash and door factory, numerous small businesses. The local economy was centered on logging and the Peshtigo Company, which owned the woodenware factory and the mill, and, and they were the major employers in town. The Peshtigo Company also ran many logging camps along the Peshtigo River, north and west of town. There the logs were cut and piled up along the river in the winter and floated to the mills in the spring. Most men worked in the camps during the winter and in the village in the summer months. Now with all of these young single men, the town had a certain reputation for rowdiness. And it's true that Peshtigo had its share of bars and brothels, but there was another side competing to set a more civilized tone. Family, church, and community. There were a lot of families settling in Peshtigo, and the company encouraged that. Lumber was provided at low cost to its workers, so there were many fine frame houses going up and many growing families. This photograph here was taken before the fire. There was a congregational church on the east side, which had just received a fresh coat of paint. And the Catholics were nearly finished. Whoops, that's not supposed to happen. The Catholics were nearly finished uh, building their own church on the west side. It was about to be plastered. The Lutheran congregation had no church building yet, but they were building a parsonage in the lower sugar bush. There was a public school that was across from the congregational church and quite a few other schools in the farm district. With all these growing families, there were many children. This is a stereographic image of the sawmill before the fire the workers there. And here's the mill dam and sash factory. See the logs floating in the mill pond. Let's take a closer look. You know, I think it's amazing that I can still use this map to get around Peshtigo. The streets are really in the same places. So over here on the east side, we have the um, sawmill with the mill dam and, and the mill pond. Over here was the large woodenware factory. And there was a company store here for the um, employees of the Peshtigo Company. And there was also a very large boarding house for the single men. The congregational church I just showed you was over here. And across the street was the school. If you go across the bridge and up French Street and Ocano Avenue, that was the downtown. There were uh, several hotels, there were general stores, a number of small businesses, even a jewelry store. The Catholic church that was being worked on was right here. And I just want to show you too this little railroad. It's a small, narrow gauge railroad. This was built by the Peshtigo Company to transport freight back and forth between Peshtigo and Peshtigo Harbor, about seven miles away. Um, it was not, they didn't yet have connecting Peshtigo to other cities and to the outside world, but the Chicago Northwestern uh, Railroad was building that line between Green Bay and um, Upper Michigan. And the construction probably contributed somewhat to the causes of the fire, but it um, had not yet reached Peshtigo. It was very much anticipated. And you'll notice there are lots of trees around the village, close up to the village. So nowadays we would call that a wildland urban interface. The Sugarbush was the farming area west of town. 
The name comes from the many stands of maple trees and other hardwoods. Now, maple trees need fertile soil. So when, the, when they were cleared, it made for good, fertile farmland. These were wonderful, prosperous farms. Many mill and factory workers in the village were saving to buy land in the bush. There was a real interconnectedness between the village, the farms, and the lumber camps. I created this map on Google Earth by plotting out as many land descriptions as I could find from tax and probate records. It shows where each of the families lived in the sugar bush, and who their neighbors were, and where they stood in the path of the fire as it came sweeping in from the southwest. You can see that there were three miles of pine forest between the village and the farming district. And the lower, middle, and upper bushes, those are the three zones that are usually described. Here's the lower bush, and the middle bush, and the upper bush. It was all south of the Peshtigo River, um, in spite of some maps that show the upper bush north of there. It was not. There were really, this was a, a loose definition. There were no real boundaries, set boundaries between them. And you can see that by this time, they had pretty much grown together. But it's still a useful way of describing the different parts of the farming district. So let's talk about some of the families that were involved in the fire. First, the Bakemen. They were next door neighbors. Their farms were three and a half miles from the village in the lower sugar bush. Like so many others in the lower bush, they were devout Lutherans from Mecklenburg. John Bakeman, or Johann Beckman, and his wife, Louisa Bartles, were both from large extended families which had settled in Peshtigo in the lower sugar bush in the 1850s. The Bakemans had come from Hagenau in Mecklenburg, and the Bartles were from Krivitz. In fact, Louisa's brother, Frederick Bartles, was the founder of Krivitz, Wisconsin. John and Louisa met and married in Peshtigo. Now, this is not really a picture of John and Louisa. I wish I had one, but not many pictures have come down. But it gives us kind of an icon so we can follow them through the story. Charles Lawrence and Maria Westfall were from Mouston and Meslin, respectively, again, in Mecklenburg. They met and were promised to each other in Meslin. And um, Charles immigrated from the port of Hamburg with the Westfall family. <coughs> now there's an interesting thing about Charles Lawrence. He had not always been called Charles Lawrence. He was baptized Johann Friedrich Jakob Lawrence. And he was known to his friends and family in Germany and when they wrote to him in America as Johann Lawrence. For some reason, and we just don't, I don't know what it is, when he came to America, he decided to call himself Charles, or Carl Lawrence. And in many cases, this came to be anglicized to Charles Lawrence. Now, you can see this final name is significantly different from his legal name in Germany. And when a man dies leaving no heirs in the United States, kinship to heirs in Germany must be established. And to do that, they had to prove that Johann Friedrich Jakob Lawrence was the same person as Charles Lawrence. And that means probate gold for a researcher. His probate file contained so many wonderful things. There was a genealogical outline with names, dates, and places of the family in Germany. There was a deposition in the American consulate from his brother Friedrich, documenting immigration, marriage, and name change. There was a marriage contract, and best of all, there were letters that he had written to his family back in Germany telling about his life in the new country. The marriage contract is very interesting. It was drawn up and signed in English in the U.S. consulate in Hamburg the very day of their immigration, September 15, 1857. Why? Well, we see it in the document. They say, here, we are here in Hamburg and about to immigrate to the United States of America and being desirous of entering into the state of matrimony and the laws of Hamburg not permitting us to do so. Now, I could do a whole presentation on the very restrictive marriage laws in Germany. It was a real hurdle for people. But the, the bottom line is that they wanted to marry, and they were not allowed to do it there. 
So in this contract in the U.S. consulate, they promised each to the other that we will love, cherish, and protect the other, that we will stand each by the other in sickness as well as in health, in adversity as well as in prosperity, and through our whole lives we'll cling to each other, forsaking all others, so long as we both shall live. I find these words very moving, and they came to have a special poignancy on October 8, 1871. But it was just a contract. It was not a, an official marriage, so they promised in the contract that as soon as they got to the United States, they would find a justice of the peace or a minister, someone who had authority, and make it official. But they didn't wait that long. They boarded the ship as single people and they disembarked in New York as a married couple. They married at sea. It was a treacherous, awful voyage. There was an outbreak of cholera on board. 17 people died and were buried at sea. And then, of course, the ship was quarantined when it came into the New York port. Well, this family managed to arrive in New York intact after six weeks. And when they were out of quarantine, they made their way to Niagara Falls, where they lived for two years. In fall of 1859, the Lawrence and Westfall families moved to Peshtigo. Charles worked in the sawmill for a number of years to raise money, and then he eventually bought that 80-acre farm in the lower sugar bush next to the Bakeman farm. This is the Lawrence family in October of 1871. We have Charles, age 37, Maria was 36, and they had four children, Carolyn, Charles, John, and a baby. The Bakeman family next door consisted of John Bakeman, age 38, and his wife Louisa was 32. They had four children, George, Charlie, Emma, and Johnny. We'll be talking about Charlie a little more. Next, I want to talk about the John Utter family in the Upper Sugar Bush. John was born in 1844 in Warwick, Canada, Canada West, which we would now call Ontario, about 26 miles from the Michigan border. In 1862, he joined the Union Army for the Civil War. This was just days after his 18th birthday. This was the, um, the legal requirement. You had to be at least 18 to enlist without parental permission. So I think this shows a certain amount of enthusiasm, especially for a Canadian. Was it, what, why did he do this? Was it a desire for adventure, a sympathy for the Union cause? I wish I knew, but we don't. This is not a real picture of him again, too, but I really like it because it, it captures my idea of him as young, enthusiastic, perhaps a bit idealistic. His regiment did not see serious action until a year later, on September 20th, 1863, when he was taken prisoner with his entire regiment at the Battle of Chickamauga. This was the beginning of a long nightmare for John Utter. He was a prisoner of war for 15 months at Charleston, Florence, and Andersonville. Now, all of the Civil, Civil War prisoner of war camps were awful, but Andersonville was in a category of its own. As you can see, there was no shelter except what the men could rig up using blankets and poles. There was poor, inadequate food and filthy water, horrible smells, and deplorable sanitary conditions. The result was rampant disease and eventually mass starvation. While he was there, utter contracted conditions which would dog him for the rest of his life, including dysentery and scurvy. He was poisoned with an impure smallpox vaccine which left him with a crippled arm. Just from stubbing his toe, he developed gangrene and he had to cut it off, his toe off himself with a broken knife blade to save his own life. He dropped from 150 to 92 pounds. When he was finally paroled and returned to his unit, his comrades and officers de described him as a mere shadow of a man, he was in a most deplorable condition, a mere skeleton of his former self. 
This is not John Utter in this picture, but it could have been him. This was a man taken from Andersonville um, near death. John Utter was in such bad shape that his commanding officer took him into his own tent to care for him. By the end of the war, John Utter was a broken man. For a year, he was cared for at home in Canada. His family described him as skin and bones, bent over like a man in his 70s. He needed help dressing for the first six months. He slowly gained some strength back, but he was never the same. For two years, he took logging jobs with his brother in northern Michigan, but he could not do the work. Then in spring of 1868, he moved to Peshtigo. In Christmas of 1868, he married 16-year-old Ada Phillips. And in 1869, he purchased land way on the northeast edge of the upper sugar bush, not far from his in-laws, the Phillips, down here. This was John Utter's property. This is the Utter family in October of 1871. John was just 27, Ada 19, and they had little Johnny was two, and Eliza Ann was just two months. Next we come to the Beebe family, and this, this is a really fascinating family, but I'll try to keep it simple for this. John and um, his wife, Frances Baldwin, um, she's usually called Frances instead of Naomi. They were both born in Connecticut into old Yankee families. Uh, the Beebe's were a family of successful merchants. In fact, his first cousin, Thomas H. Beebe, was president of the Peshtigo Company in Chicago. And Beebe Avenue here in Peshtigo is named after him. Frances's family, the Baldwins, had moved early on to Detroit, where they became wealthy and affluent. They were pillars of Detroit society. I sometimes get the feeling that John must have always been trying to live up to his wife's family, not always succeeding very well. Shortly after marriage, the couple moved to Lyons, Iowa, across from Omaha. But his business failed in 1857, and they returned to Detroit. Now, John's deceased father had had business ties in Mobile, Alabama. So late in 1859, they moved there and opened up an insurance agency. I think this seems to be bad timing for a Yankee to move to Alabama. 1859? So yes, before long, we have Private John E. Beebe in the Confederate Army. Again, this is not really this picture. Uh, now, we have no way of knowing what his real sympathies were in the war, whether he joined because he wanted to or because he had to. But we do know that when the war was over, as soon as it was over, John and Francis headed back north. Eventually, he called in a favor from his cousin, Thomas H. Beebe, of the Peshtigo Company, and they landed in Peshtigo. I think he probably was the only Confederate soldier for miles around. I have a feeling he probably kept that on the down low. John worked as a bookkeeper for the company store. That seems like a fairly modest job, but it had good prospects. William Ellis, who was the supervisor of all operations in Peshtigo, had started as a bookkeeper for the company store. So here's the Beebe family in October 1871. John E. Beebe was 40, his wife Frances was 38, and they had four surviving children, Naomi, Willie, Celia, and little baby Evan. Now, we can't really talk about the Peshtigo fire without mentioning Father Peter Pernin. I know there'll be another presentation on him, but um, I'm gonna touch on some aspects of his story here too. He was born Jean-Pierre Pernin, in France in 1822, and he was a missionary priest on the U.S. frontier. At that time, that included Illinois, Wisconsin, and later Minnesota. In 1871, he was a pastor of parishes in both Marinette and Peshtigo. He strikes me as a very energetic and enthusiastic man. He was a church builder. He supervised the building of a church, school, and rectory in Marinette building a church in Peshtigo, which was nearly completed. 
all of them burned, by the way. This photograph of him was taken more than 20 years after the fire, and it really is a photo of him. Yay. I really like it. Um, it I think it, it shows a little bit of his personality. He just looks like a very strong, sturdy, determined man. Great determination. Most important for our purposes, he was the author of the best eyewitness account of the Peshtigo fire. <coughs> so what were the conditions that October in 1871 in the Peshtigo area? First, there had been a severe drought. There was very little snow the winter before, and through the summer and fall, there had been only two short rainfalls, which were quickly absorbed. Many creeks, ponds, and wells had gone dry. The fuel load was absolutely massive. The pine forests um, were there, and the dropped pine needles. There were huge piles of slash, the leftover parts of the tree when they cut trees, piled up around lumber camps, the railroad right-of-way construction, and just when farmers cleared their land. Leaves had fallen, and there had been a killing frost on September 20th, leaving a blanket of dried leaves and dead vegetation. The marshes had dried to several feet below ground, resulting in huge amounts of explosively flammable peat. In the village were logs and mill waste curing in the mill yard, all bone dry. There were wooden sidewalks and corduroy roads, and there was sawdust everywhere. Even on the streets, they used it to keep the dust down. Basically, it was like a funeral pyre. And there were many fires going on in the woods. Both above ground and smoldering below ground where it would eat away at the roots of trees. Now this was fire season, so fires and smoke were common at this time of year, but they were much worse than usual this, this time. There were many causes. Clearing land for farms and the railroad right of way, burning slash. Fire was a tool that was used by everyone and sometimes it got away. The people were fighting fire constantly as far south as the Horicon Marsh. In fact, a huge fire had nearly destroyed Peshtigo two weeks earlier, but the citizens had fought it off. They really thought they'd dodged a bullet. Because of all these fires, northeast Wisconsin was under a pall of smoke, even in cities like Green Bay. It irritated the eyes, throats, and lungs. Near Marinette, the Green Island Lighthouse had to keep the light lit all day long to prevent shipping. Again, some degree this happened every fall. The feeling was that the rain would come and that would take care of it. But this season, the rain did not come. The result, people who denied it, but most people were very anxious. They were exhausted from the constant vigilance and effort of firefighting. It was getting hard to breathe. Many spoke of a heavy, oppressive atmosphere which hung over the area for several days before the fire. Some managed to deny it, but others were sick with dread that a terrible calamity was approaching. One person who felt the sense of dread was Father Kernan. He had been watching the development of the fires around the town with increasing concern. And that day there was an oppressive atmosphere. He felt strangely dull and lethargic. He noted young people passing by, bent only on amusement, as he said, but he felt apprehensive and listless. He feared some coming disaster. At about 8.30 p.m., he saw a red glow over the horizon in the southwest and heard a distant roar. Immediately, his lethargy fell away, and he became very focused. He knew what he had to do. So let's look at our Lawrence and Nathan families in the lower sugar bush. Charlie Bakeman, who was then a boy of 11, told the story of that day many years later. His mother had been extremely anxious. She, wouldn't, she kept the children at home, and she wouldn't let them go hunting or playing with their friends like they usually did on Sundays. She insisted that they and her husband get water and fill the barrels all around the house. She told them to bring in the cattle and horses and prepare the harness and lumber wagon and keep in case they could get away in a hurry. Mr. Bakeman seemed to think she was a little nuts but he humored her and he did as he was told. When he and his son Charlie were out in the pasture rounding up stray cattle, their neighbor, Charles Lawrence, came running toward them looking worried. Bateman, he said, something terrible is going to happen. I don't know what it is. Mr. Bateman replied, well, Charlie, you're tired and wore out. 
You go home and have, lay on your couch and have a sleep, and you'll feel a whole lot better. Well, Charles Lawrence did not look reassured, but he turned and trotted towards home. Bakeman stared after him for a few moments, and then he said, well, I guess he's gone crazy, too. And then they continued to do what Mrs. Bakeman had asked. In the upper bush, Ada Otter was, was very sick in bed with her two-month-old baby. Her mother had visited and nursed her the day before, but on this Sunday, it was up to John to care for his sick wife and the two small children. What none of them could know was that there was a massive low-pressure system forming over the Midwest, which would bring gale force southwesterly winds to Wisconsin, Michigan, and northern Illinois that night. A fire, as most of you know, needs three things fuel, a spark, and oxygen. When that strong wind came in from the southwest, bringing an inrush of oxygen, it acted as a bellows on all of those small fires in the woods. On both sides of the bay, those smaller fires exploded into large ones, and then they coalesced into a firestorm. By the time it reached the Peshtigo area, the fire front was at least 12 miles wide. The flames rose high above the very tall trees, Already it was a conflagration, moving six to seven miles an hour, and it was bearing down on a lower sugar bush. The fire first hit in the lower sugar bush at about 8 p.m. Being five families, people were just getting into bed or were already in bed. It began as a red glow in the southwest sky, and then a roar growing louder and louder, and then a hot wind becoming a gale. In a very short time, too fast to run from it, Flames became visible in the trees, high up. Ashes and embers began to fall like snow. And as people tried to flee, firebrands thrown ahead of the fire front set new spot fires ahead of them. They were quickly surrounded by fire. One of the strangest and most terrifying oddities of this fire was huge black balloon-like objects which spun through the air and exploded like artillery and burst into flame when they made contact with trees or houses or any other object. These were reported all over the sugar bush and in the village as well. And the same phenomenon was observed in the Hinkley, Minnesota firestorm 23 years later. The fire front descended on the farms with unimaginable fury. The very air seemed to be on fire. Very quickly, people died. Some burned, others died from suffocation or from breathing in, breathing in the superheated air. They died in cellars and wells. They died in their homes. They died in the fields or roads or woods as they tried to flee. What's really amazing is that any survived. Unlike those in the village, they had no river to run to flee to. Some were able to lie in streams or ponds that had not completely dried in the drought. And many tried to flee to the village by wagon. Some made it. But in most cases, all that remained by morning was wagon wheels and skeletons and ashes. Another common escape was to take shelter in a plowed field or clear in the hope that there'd be enough fuel to there would not be enough fuel to feed the fire there. This was a very good plan in a normal fire, but this was not a normal fire. This fire seemed to burn even when there was little or no visible fuel. Plus, embers and brands were dropping from above, and they lit hair and clothing on fire. It helped if people could cover with blankets, but they still had to constantly beat out the flames. Many covered themselves or their children with dirt. Now, people would not have been sitting or standing as they are in this painting. They would have been lying in the ground with their faces planted in the dirt, gasping for breathable air. So, what was happening with our lower sugar bush families? As Charlie Bakeman told it, he and his brothers and sisters were just settling into bed at about 8 p.m. when they heard their mother scream. They looked out the window and saw that the whole sky was aglow and a terrible roar was growing in the southwest. They all hurried outside and hitched up the wagon, which was already nearly ready to go, because she had told them to do that. As they did so, they heard explosions, and those fire balloons that I described hit trees and their roof and the house was quickly engulfed in flame. They could see a great fire world bearing down on them, drawing everything into it. Mrs. Bakeman's preparations saved them. They were ready quickly, and with their horse running at full tilt, they stayed ahead of the fire, but barely. In places, the firestorm winds had knocked down trees in their path, 
and they managed to go around or jump the wagon across them and did not want to stop. When they reached Peshtigo, the Bateman screamed warnings at the citizens there, but many did not seem to believe them. All too soon, the danger was obvious and the fire was upon them. Many people ran in terror to the river. Others dove into wells, one after the other. And sometimes they simply stood and prayed, dying where they stood. The Batemans continued in their wagon over the bridge, hoping to stay ahead of the fire. But they immediately found that the east side of town was on fire as well. They were surrounded, so they turned and hurried into the river. Turning to the Lawrence family, two slightly different stories have come down to us. In one, like the Bakemans, they had made it to the village and were hurrying to the river. In another, they were huddling together in a clearing like so many others, hoping the inferno would pass around them. What the eyewitnesses agree on was that as the family clung together, one of those huge black fire balloons landed on them, wiping them out instantly. The words in their marriage contract come back to mind. And they and through our whole lives, we will cling to each other, forsaking all others, so long as we both shall live. And they did indeed cling to each other as their lives came to an end in that awful inferno. Back to Father Peter Vernon in the Peshtigo village. When he began to hear a muffled roar and saw a red glide, a glow over the western horizon, just before 8.30, he, turned, he became very focused and active. He turned his horse loose and digging a deep trench to bury valuables and church ornaments. All the while he worked, the roar grew louder and the distant glow intensified. The winds picked up and became violent, and they were hot. When his task was completed, Hernan ran inside to get the blessed sacrament, the consecrated bread and wine, which he intended to take with him. And in the house, he saw clouds of sparks bouncing from room to room and exploding like gunpowder caps. So he quickly just grabbed the entire tabernacle and placed it on the small wagon which he would have to pull by himself since he'd set his horse free. He called for his dog, but the poor thing was, too, was hiding and wouldn't come. And there was no more time. He had already delayed too long. When Father Fernand went to open the gate to go out with his wagon, a sudden fierce wind took the gate and the entire fence and blew it away. He himself was blown down several times as he pulled the wagon toward the river, but he managed to get up again. I'm just going to show you. The, he lived right by the Catholic Church, so we can assume that he went up Ocanto Avenue here on the way to the river. Ocano Avenue was already thronged with frenzy people and animals running in every direction as built them. It quickly became extremely difficult ashes, embers, smoke, and fire. Families became separated, and people began dropping. Father Bernie fell over something and found that it was a dead woman and girl. He got up and continued on. The sounds were terrible. In addition to the roar of the wind and flames, there were screams of animals and the crash of chimneys and trees. The people, though, were strangely silent. I want to show you what the route that he went. He had come from the church, and again, he came up Ocano and French Street toward the river. And feeling that the west side might be safer, Father Perrin made his way across the bridge, which was jammed with people, cattle, wagons, going in both directions. When he reached the other side, he first intended to go to the right. He wanted to get to the mudflats where a number of people did survive, but the sawmill and company store by then were engulfed in flames, so that made that route impassable. The big boarding house was also engulfed in flame. About 70 people had taken refuge there. Now I sometimes hear comments about how foolish those people were to have taken refuge in a wooden building in a fire. <coughs> you have to remember that they were absolutely in a panic and there were no good choices. And when fire is falling from the sky, your first instinct is to get under something, to take shelter. Right. Sadly, all of those people were burned in the boarding house. Father Vernon instead turned to the left and made his way down to the river. He kept a safe distance from the bridge. Uh, it was already on fire, and he feared that it might collapse, which it soon did with everyone on it. At the riverbank, he found people standing in dumb, indecisive terror. They seemed to feel that the end of the world had arrived and that it would be sinful to resist it. So Father Kernan solved the theological dilemma by pushing them into the water. <coughs> Where in all this horror was the Beattie family, our Confederate Yankee and his wife and four children? 
Well, they had taken refuge in the company store until that building became engulfed, and they had to make a run for the river. John was carrying two-year-old Celia, and Francis carried Evan, the baby. Five-year-old Willie became separated immediately, and John called out, for God's sake, find my boy. Then they lost little Naomi. They didn't have far to run, it must have seemed like miles. The smoke, the heat, and the flames were too much. One by one, they dropped to the ground as they tried to reach the river. Only little Willie, who was rescued by a stranger, survived the night. Their neighbor, Mrs. Ellis, described their fate in a letter to a friend. Mr. Beebe and family were burned to death, trying to get from the store to the river. He stayed too long. He was crazed with fright. It was an awful thing for our darling Mrs. Beebe and the family we loved so well to meet such a fate. Her little boy was saved. Three darling children died with them. It was about 10 o'clock when Father Kernan parked his wagon on the shore and went into the river. The tabernacle on the wagon, by the way, was found the next morning, miraculously free from damage, and you can see it over in the fire museum. The Kashiko River was the only means of escape for most people in the village, but it was still fraught with danger. Up to their necks in water, people jostled with horses, cows, pigs, even deer. Many drowned. Even the water was not refuge from the flames. Everyone had to constantly duck their heads or pour water on each other to prevent their hair from bursting into flame. Some burned to death there in the water. There were strange sights in the river. Charlie Bateman told of seeing a woman going by riding in the back of a steer. And he had to duck his head under the water, and when he came back up, she was gone. At its worst, those in the river could see nothing but flames in any direction. Even the sky was filled with roiling flames. The air itself seemed to be on fire. So what about our family in the upper sugar bush, the udders? You can see that up here in the northeast corner, they were probably among the last to be hit by the fire. You might remember that Ada Utter was sitting in bed with her time. He must have been horrified when he heard that roar and saw the fire approaching through the trees. He was still weak and somewhat crippled from his POW experience, and there was no way he was going to be able to carry all three of them. So he grabbed his two-year-old son and ran from the house hoping to catch some friends who passed by and to give them the, the toddler and then come back for his wife and daughter. And he couldn't find his friends. In a panic, he ran back home and found that his house was engulfed in flames. Ada and Eliza Ann were in there, and he could do nothing. All that remained was to try to find safety for himself and his little boy. In the morning, his in-laws, the Phillips, found John stumbling along the road clutching his toddler under his coat. The child was dead. John Otter had passed through hell once again. Father Purdy was in the river for about five and a half hours by his own reckoning. On his first attempt to get out, a voice warned him that he was on fire and he quickly got back in. Finally, Peter Kernan, the Bakemans, and all the other survivors were able to emerge from the water and they collapsed exhausted on the bank. Ironically, they faced a new danger from the cold. They were soaked to the skin, and this was October in northern Wisconsin. Also, many were unable to see because their eyes were swollen shut from the heat. For those who could see, one more horror awaited them. When the sun rose, they saw what was left of Peshtigo. All around was a moonscape of ashes. Worse, dead bodies were scattered everywhere, most of them burned beyond recognition. These are actual images from Peshtigo at the time. Here's some more images that were taken. You can see all that's left of this rail car is the wheels and the frame. It was just complete devastation. Help eventually did come to supply the needs of the survivors and to bury the many dead. Luther Noyes, editor of the Marinette and Peshtigo Eagle, wrote to Governor Fairchild explaining the situation and begging for help. I'm writing you neither a frenzy nor a fancy sketch. Would to God it was. It is a heartbreaking reality, and I'm telling you the truth. These words are typical of comments made by reporters, letter writers, and others. The expression, no pen can tell the tale, came up in many accounts. The Peshtigo fire is simply too horrific for words. One very moving letter captures the grief and desperation of the survivors in the days after the disaster. The Newberries were a large, prosperous clan in the lower sugar bush. They lost 12 family members in the fire. Daughter, Martha Newberry Coon, wrote to her sister-in-law a couple days later, 
The letter reveals a woman nearly unhinged by grief and shock. Menominee, Michigan, October 10, 1871. Dear sister, I have bad news to tell. Charlie and his two little boys are gone. Oh, what a horrible death. There was a tornado or fire swept over the farming district and on the Peshtigo village. It came us very suddenly. Charlie and his family started to flee. They got about half a mile from home when they went into a little pool of water. Charlie had the two children and some things he was trying to save. He passed through the water, thinking to get farther away from the fire. But Grace turned back into the water and was saved. In the water were Brother William and his family, his wife and baby, and his wife's sister. They were all that remained to tell the tale. Oh, Mary, it was truly a night of horror. It rained fire. The air was on fire. Some thought the last day had come. Mary, my father, four brothers, two sisters-in-law, and five of their children. Oh, dear Mary, we are almost crazy. One can hardly keep one's senses together to write me anything. George went over to see if he could find their bodies. He found Charlie and the children about five yards from where Grace was. Charlie and Jesse were lying on their faces, and Frankie was sitting down by a stump with his hands up to his face. Poor, poor little ones. Mother was, mother was saved. She was in Menominee on a visit, but poor old father, he was burned, and lost all of my brothers. George counted 89 bodies within the space of half a mile. There were probably 300 dead. Oh, Mary, Grace has no clothes, I either. Our eyes, are, our clothes are all burned, and our eyes are burned. But we're better now. Grace has poultices on her eyes, and they're getting better. George and Eddie and I were saved by fleeing to the river. Grace wants to go to her father as soon as she gets me. George and I did not save any clothes. Eddie was in bed. I got him up and dressed him without his stockings. He's without his stockings to his name. Poor Grace is sadly afflicted. And my poor mother. George found the bodies of all our folks except for three of his wife. He's going tomorrow with some men's lord to bury them. Oh, it's too horrible to write about or believe. Or if only they'd gone to heaven. They had time. They must have prayed. Grace said Jesse and Frankie prayed. And he said, pray, Mom, to God. And oh, how we did pray. Those who never prayed before prayed that night. I can't write anymore. All I can think of is those dead bodies lying there in the woods. Write to Grace as soon as you can. Martha. Those who survived the Peshtigo fire retained physical and psychological scars the rest of their lives. For many others, their lives were ended. Ada Utter and her two little children. The Beebe family. Charles and Maria Lawrence and all their children. Many of the dead lie in the Peshtigo Cemetery, including a mass grave for those who were burned beyond recognition. Many more are buried in the Harmony Cemetery in the upper sugar bush, including another mass grave. And more in the May Corner Cemetery in the lower sugar bush. There's one gravestone far away that moves me deeply. 15-year-old Nellie Marshall, by all accounts a lovely girl, was separated from her family as they fled through the streets of Peshtigo. They found her body the next morning. Her heartbroken family carried her back to Vermont for burial, and there she still lies. These words, darling Nellie, say so much about unbearable pain and loss. The Peshtigo fire was a historic event on a large scale. It was also a personal trauma and tragedy for the individuals and families who went, with, went through it. They deserve to be remembered.